chapter twenty of abraham lincoln a history volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume six by john hay and john george nicolay chapter twenty negro soldiers in resorting to the policy of general military emancipation president lincoln did not mean to rely upon its merely sentimental effect from the time when the necessities of war forced upon him the adoption of that policy it was coupled with the expectation of making it bring to the help of the union armies a powerful contingent of negro soldiers we find from several entries in the diary of secretary chase that this course was foreshadowed at the cabinet meetings following that of july twenty two eighteen sixty two when he submitted the first draft of his emancipation proclamation while the time had not yet in his judgment arrived for a general arming of the blacks he nevertheless indicated an intention to organize and use a military force of negroes for a specific object the dispositions made and orders given by general halleck concerning the western armies prior to his transfer to washington left no provision for the work of opening the mississippi river but the president had this enterprise so much at heart that he asked general o m mitchell july twenty five eighteen sixty two with what force he could take vicksburg and clear the river and with the black population on its banks hold it open below memphis mitchell replied that with his own division and curtis's army then in arkansas he thought he could do it the plan would doubtless have been adopted had not general halleck decided that mitchell's division could not be spared from buell's army and that curtis's army must remain in arkansas to keep the trans-mississippi confederates out of missouri lincoln's reliance on the black population to contribute a compact and effective military force thus distinctly indicated contemporaneously with his decision to give freedom to slaves in rebel states by military decree was not thereafter abandoned though he felt constrained to postpone a systematic organization of negro troops for active campaigns he nevertheless expressed his willingness that commanders should at their discretion arm for purely defensive purposes slaves coming within their lines and on august twenty five eighteen sixty two the secretary of war formally authorized general saxton in command at port royal to arm uniform equip and drill not exceeding five thousand volunteers of african descent to guard and protect the plantations and settlements at port royal and elsewhere this authority was given in pursuance of the very guarded provisions which congress had recently embodied in the confiscation act and in an act amending the force bill of seventeen ninety five both of which laws had been approved by the president on july seventeenth eighteen sixty two the last day of the session section eleven of the former empowered the president to employ as many persons of african descent as he may deem necessary and proper for the suppression of this rebellion and for this purpose he may organize and use them in such manner as he may judge best for the public welfare section twelve of the latter was a trifle more specific but the gingerly manner in which the topic was approached and the careful choice of words to say one thing and mean another give abundant evidence of the extreme sensitiveness of opinion on the subject in congress as well as out of it the section provided that the president be and he is hereby authorized to receive into the service of the united states for the purpose of constructing entrenchments or performing camp service or any other labor or any military or naval service for which they may be found competent persons of african descent 
and such persons shall be enrolled and organized under such regulations not inconsistent with the constitution and laws as the president may prescribe further significance was given to the language by a clause in section fifteen of the same act which read that persons of african descent who under this law shall be employed shall receive ten dollars per month and one ration three dollars of which monthly pay may be in clothing the subject is not mentioned in the preliminary proclamation of september twenty two eighteen sixty two but the final emancipation proclamation of january one eighteen sixty three contains the full announcement of the new military policy and i further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the united states to garrison forts positions stations and other places and to man vessels of all sorts in said service tentative experiments with negro soldiers had indeed been made during the year eighteen sixty two but without producing any considerable results general david hunter was the pioneer in these experiments almost immediately after his arrival at the department of the south he asked the secretary of war for fifty thousand muskets and authority to arm such loyal men as i can find in the country and with an eye to the seductive effects of a brilliant uniform he added a request for fifty thousand pairs of scarlet pantaloons saying this is all the clothing i shall require for these people this somewhat extravagant requisition was not the only bit of humor which grew out of the incident some time afterwards at the instance of a pro-slavery member of congress from kentucky the house of representatives passed a resolution asking information about the alleged organizing and arming of fugitive slaves the secretary of war referred the resolution to the general who replied in a letter of great apparent gravity that there were no fugitive slaves in his department but that he had a fine regiment of loyal persons whose late masters were fugitive rebels whom we have only partially been able to see chiefly their heads over ramparts or rifle in hand dodging behind trees in the extreme distance in the absence of any fugitives master law the deserted slaves would be wholly without remedy had not the crime of treason given them the right to pursue capture and bring back those persons of whose protection they have been thus suddenly bereft the secretary of war with the same gravity sent the reply to the house of representatives where it was read amid roars of laughter to the great discomfiture of the mover of the resolution of inquiry and served more than months of discussion would have done to hasten the already swiftly moving change of public sentiment general hunter's experiment however was a greater parliamentary than military success there was still too much prejudice in the army itself and particularly among army officers against such an innovation the blacks did not come forward freely to enlist and when the general undertook to compel them by drafting it confirmed in their minds the stories which had been told them that it was a renewed slavery that they were to be sold to cuba that they were to be placed in the front rank of battle for slaughter and many other direful predictions under such conditions though the regiment was formed it was beset by desertion by neglect by contempt and also by the fatal difficulty that under existing regulations the paymaster could not recognize it from all these causes it languished and was with the exception of one company formally disbanded about three months afterwards the whole history of this first experiment but repeats the constant lesson that statesmen generals and reformers must always and unavoidably reckon with public opinion when they undertake to change either for worse or for better the complex machinery of modern society and government the failure of hunter's regiment was only temporary it furnished the germ of later success one company under command of sergeant c t trowbridge as acting captain 
held together in spite of all discouragement and neglect and when general saxton received the already mentioned orders of the secretary of war dated august twenty five eighteen sixty two to organize five thousand volunteers of african descent it became the first company of the first south carolina volunteers a regiment the formation of which was begun on the seventh of november t w higginson of massachusetts was appointed its colonel and took command about the first of december even then recruiting was slow the regiment numbered five hundred when colonel higginson took command and six weeks or more elapsed before it was completed we find a repetition of these identical difficulties of surmounting the prejudices and obstacles of public opinion at the other territorial extremity of the country on the sixth of august senator and general j h lane of kansas telegraphed to the secretary of war from fort leavenworth in that state i am receiving negroes under the late act of congress is there any objection answer by telegraph soon have an army there is no record of the secretary's answer the probability is he made none but remembering that the inquiry came from a region of border ruffian memories and methods left lane to his own devices and responsibilities slaves of rebel masters became free under the confiscation laws and this was a numerous class in western missouri but besides receiving those who had a right to enlist if we credit frequent complaints lane and lane's men also sometimes resorted to forcible recruiting among the slaves of the loyal no definite or coherent record remains whereby truth may be gleaned from error amid very vague and conflicting statements we know also that general curtis the department commander was not disposed to throw obstacles in lane's way thus he wrote on september twenty ninth eighteen sixty two lane's movements are often much exaggerated and for that reason the rebels are very much afraid of him so far as they are concerned a reign of terror is the proper check to them and it would be well to make them understand they will have no sympathy at your hands if he will pitch in at cowskin prairie he will not be likely to go amiss i am told it is not much better about independence we have got to fight the devil with fire we are not likely to use one negro where the rebels have used a thousand yet under all these favoring conditions the first kansas colored was not organized as a regiment until january thirteenth eighteen sixty three about six months after lane began receiving colored recruits the time required shows us the resistance of a fixed prejudice which had to be overcome at every point the third and most successful of the several preliminary experiments with colored soldiers was made by general butler while at new orleans in command of the department of the gulf he had scarcely taken command of the city when contrabands from among the redundant slave population began to crowd upon every military office station and camp to bring information and offer service and in return to receive protection and food so far as possible he endeavored to make them useful but he soon found the problem outgrowing his means after some three weeks of experience on may twenty five eighteen sixty two he formally asked the instructions of the government in the course of his letter he wrote the military necessity does not exist here for the employment of negroes in arms in order that we may have an acclimated force if the war department desires and will permit i can have five thousand able-bodied white citizens enlisted within sixty days all of whom have lived here many years and many of them drilled soldiers to be commanded by intelligent loyal officers besides i hope and believe that this war will be ended before any body of negroes could be organized armed and drilled so as to be efficient in due time the general under date of june fourteen received authority to raise five thousand white volunteers but his questions about negroes were left unanswered because the president though studying the slavery question more thoroughly and anxiously than any of his officers was not yet ready to announce a general policy 
brigadier general j w phelps whom butler had placed in command at carrollton seven miles above new orleans was dealing with the same problem in the light of his conscientious and active abolition feelings he had given fugitive slaves every encouragement and protection possible under his military orders and on june sixteenth he wrote a long letter to butler's adjutant-general recommending that the president should declare the military abolition of slavery and suggesting that through the instrumentality of military service our slaves might be raised in the scale of civilization and prepared for freedom fifty regiments might be raised among them at once which could be employed in this climate to preserve order etc butler referred the communication without discussion to the secretary of war with the explanation that general phelps i believe intends making this a test case for the policy of the government and adding for himself i respect his honest sincerity of opinion but i am a soldier bound to carry out the wishes of my government so long as i hold its commission and i understand that policy to be the one i am pursuing the president's cautious answer was transmitted by the secretary of war on the third of july he is of opinion wrote mr stanton that under the laws of congress they cannot be sent back to their masters that in common humanity they must not be permitted to suffer for want of food shelter or other necessaries of life that to this end they should be provided for by the quartermasters and commissaries departments and that those who are capable of labor should be set to work and paid reasonable wages in directing this to be done the president does not mean at present to settle any general rule in respect to slaves or slavery but simply to provide for the particular case under the circumstances in which it is now presented meanwhile on july thirty phelps forced the question anew on general butler by making requisitions for arms accoutrements clothing camp and garrison equipage etc for three regiments of africans which i propose to raise for the defence of this point butler reported this request to the war department with the further information that phelps without his knowledge or orders had organized five companies of negroes and on the same day august two replied to phelps i do not think you are empowered to organize into companies negroes and drill them as a military organization i cannot sanction this course of action as at present advised he had already suggested to phelps to employ his five companies of africans upon necessary work the removal of woods about his entrenchments a kind of labor in which a recent act of congress had specially authorized the employment of negroes phelps however deeming it his mission to reform the government rather than render military service forwarded the general his resignation with the unwarranted and offensive comment while i am willing to prepare african regiments for the defence of the government against its assailants i am not willing to become the mere slave-driver which you propose having no qualifications in that way butler argued the point with him in a temperate and forbearing response but phelps persisted in his insubordinate obstinacy and his resignation was accepted by the war department if the headstrong vermont brigadier who was a man of ability and an educated soldier had possessed the patience and that proper recognition of discipline which his profession enjoined he would not only have been gratified by the early acceptance of his views but might have rendered himself useful in promoting and hastening the object he professed to have so deeply at heart even before his resignation was accepted general butler who about the middle of august apprehended an attack had taken the initial steps to bring about the organization and employment of colored troops for which he found a precedent begun by the rebel governor moore of louisiana for rebel uses before the capture of new orleans by the union army in his testimony before the committee on the conduct of the war general butler says upon examining the records i found that governor moore of louisiana had raised a regiment of free colored people and organized it and officered it and i found one of his commissions i sent for a colored man as an officer of that regiment 
and got some fifteen or sixteen of the officers together black and mulatto light and dark coloured and asked them what they meant by being organized under the rebels they said they had been ordered out and could not refuse but that the rebels had never trusted them with arms they had been drilled in company drill i asked them if that organization could be resuscitated provided they were supplied with arms they said that it could very well i said then i will resuscitate that regiment of louisiana militia i thereupon issued an order stating the precedent furnished by governor moore and in a week from that time i had in that regiment a thousand men reasonably drilled and well disciplined better disciplined than any other regiment i had there because the blacks had been always taught to do as they were told it was composed altogether of free men made free under some law early in september the general reported i shall also have within ten days a regiment one thousand strong of native guards colored the darkest of whom will be about the complexion of the late mr webster this example is also important in illustrating the influence of public opinion on the question new orleans had a large foreign population and many of the native whites had their sentiments and traditions modified to a great extent by their european origin the race prejudice of richmond and charleston did not exist in new orleans in its full intensity and its absence had enabled the rebel governor of louisiana to form his regiment of free blacks for rebel service french and english law did not permit citizens of those countries to hold slaves a circumstance which furnished both the governor and general butler a large proportion of free blacks and afforded the former the pretext of employing them under military organization to protect the persons and property of their alien masters i accordingly enlisted one regiment and part of another from men in that condition continues general butler we had a great many difficulties about it but the english consul came very fairly up to the mark and decided that the negroes claimed as slaves by those who had registered themselves as british subjects were all free so that i never enlisted a slave indeed it was a general order that no slave should be enlisted another resource for negro recruits grew out of the fact that one of the general's expeditions took military possession of a large district in which were located the heavy sugar plantations of louisiana and which contained fifteen thousand to twenty thousand slaves under section nine of the confiscation act of july seventeenth eighteen sixty two all these slaves became free and from their number butler obtained enough additional black recruits to complete a second and third regiment of negro infantry and also a negro regiment of heavy artillery three of these regiments were employed in military duty one in the city of new orleans the other two to guard the opelousas railroad west of new orleans the remaining regiments he found it necessary to employ in agricultural service the same spirit that moved planters to burn their cotton induced a combination among them in the district occupied by the federal army to abstain from the necessary fall layering of sugar-cane for the next year's crop and to this duty as well as providing for other crops to sustain the slave population butler assigned one of his black regiments from the result we have summarized it is evident that without president lincoln's policy and decrees of military emancipation the negro population would have furnished but a scanty addition to the armies fighting to maintain the union nor indeed did the mere issuing of the final proclamation of january one eighteen sixty three work any sudden transformation the full manhood which springs from liberty and individual self-assertion needed still to be aroused and stimulated and the president lost no time in setting on foot earnest practical efforts to realize the substantial benefits he had contemplated accordingly he wrote to general dix commanding at fort monroe on the fourteenth of january eighteen sixty three the proclamation has been issued we were not succeeding at best were progressing too slowly without it now that we have it 
and bear all the disadvantages of it as we do bear some in certain quarters we must also take some benefit from it if practicable i therefore will thank you for your well-considered opinion whether fort monroe and your town one or both could not in whole or in part be garrisoned by colored troops leaving the white forces now necessary at those places to be employed elsewhere general dix had been a buchanan democrat until the outbreak of the rebellion and when we take his political antecedents and prejudices into account his answer was reasonably promising even with its coldness and want of faith fort monroe he thought was too important to be entrusted to colored troops at yorktown perhaps they might be used to the extent of one half the necessary garrison but he said i doubt very much whether colored troops can be raised here an officer from massachusetts who has taken an interest in the question interrogated the adult males of the colored population at camp hamilton and newport news and found only five or six who were willing to take up arms the general reply was that they were willing to work but did not wish to fight i deem it not improper to say further that the feeling towards the north among a considerable portion of the colored refugees is not a cordial one they understand that we deny them in many of the free states the right of suffrage and that even in those where political equality is theoretically established by law social prejudices practically neutralize it the president waited some weeks and then turned his inquiry in another direction on the twenty sixth of march eighteen sixty three he wrote to andrew johnson at nashville then military governor of the state of tennessee i am told you have at least thought of raising a negro military force in my opinion the country now needs no specific thing so much as some man of your ability and position to go to this work when i speak of your position i mean that of an eminent citizen of a slave state and himself a slaveholder the colored population is the great available and yet unavailed of force for restoring the union the bare sight of fifty thousand armed and drilled black soldiers upon the banks of the mississippi would end the rebellion at once and who doubts that we can present that sight if we but take hold in earnest if you have been thinking of it please do not dismiss the thought there is no record that governor johnson ever made any reply to this proposal of the president the governor was already rendering important public service and he perhaps reasoned justly that the time had not arrived when he could undertake a leadership full of such difficulties uncertainties and risks although later in the same year he took hold of the task in a more restricted and qualified way and cordially gave his personal and executive assistance in organizing colored regiments meanwhile under the combined influence of patriotism and military ambition many northern men of prominence and energy and also imbued with liberal and progressive sentiments came forward and volunteered their services to officer and organize negro regiments in the south it required courage at that time to take this step for the confederate authorities had published a ban of outlawry and retaliation against all who should serve in such a capacity a few days after his letter to governor johnson the president wrote to general banks at new orleans hon daniel allman with a commission of a brigadier general and two or three hundred other gentlemen as officers goes to your department and reports to you for the purpose of raising a colored brigade to now avail ourselves of this element of force is very important if not indispensable i therefore will thank you to help general allman forward with his undertaking as much and as rapidly as you can and also to carry the general object beyond his particular organization if you find it practicable the necessity of this is palpable if as i understand you are now unable to effect anything with your present force and which force is soon to be greatly diminished by the expiration of terms of service as well as by ordinary causes i shall be very glad if you will take hold of the matter in earnest you will receive from the department a regular order upon this subject 
general banks responded to the president's request with great energy and with such success that on the seventeenth of august he made the following report of what he had accomplished in the four or five months which had elapsed general allman has now five regiments nearly completed numbering about twenty three hundred men or five hundred to each regiment i have twenty one regiments nearly organized three upon the basis of a thousand men each and eighteen of five hundred men making in all ten thousand or twelve thousand men there are also batteries of artillery and companies of cavalry in process of organization these embrace all the material for such regiments that is within my command at the present time so also continuing the same industrious prompting the president wrote to general hunter in the department of the south a few days after his letter to banks i am glad to see the accounts of your colored force at jacksonville florida i see the enemy are driving at them fiercely as is to be expected it is important to the enemy that such a force shall not take shape and grow and thrive in the south and in precisely the same proportion it is important to us that it shall hence the utmost caution and vigilance is necessary on our part the enemy will make extra efforts to destroy them and we should do the same to preserve and increase them it is unnecessary to follow the details and results attending these local efforts it will be more interesting to read the correspondence growing out of another scheme to promote individual leadership in the great enterprise we have seen how general fremont had failed in two important military trusts confided to his judgment and care notwithstanding these failures the general retained the admiration and confidence of many influential politicians and considerable classes of citizens in the country who believed that his prestige and ability ought to be utilized and who now sent the president a memorial suggesting that he ought to be made an organizer and commander of negro troops on this subject president lincoln on the first of june eighteen sixty three wrote to senator sumner in relation to the matter spoken of saturday morning and this morning to wit the raising of colored troops in the north with the understanding that they shall be commanded by general fremont i have to say that while it is very objectionable as a general rule to have troops raised on any special term such as to serve only under a particular commander or only at a particular place or places yet i would forego the objection in this case upon a fair prospect that a large force of this sort could thereby be more rapidly raised that being raised say to the number of ten thousand i would very cheerfully send them to the field under general fremont assigning him a department made or to be made with such white force also as i might be able to put in that with the best wishes towards general fremont i cannot now give him a department because i have not spare troops to furnish a new department and i have not as i think justifiable ground to relieve the present commander of any old one in the raising of the colored troops the same consent of governors would have to be obtained as in case of white troops and the government would make the same provision for them during organization as for white troops it would not be a point with me whether general fremont should take charge of the organization or take charge of the force only after the organization if you think fit to communicate this to general fremont you are at liberty to do so the result of the inquiry is given in the following reply from general fremont to mr sumner i was pressingly reminded of your note by a visit from the committee which had called upon mr lincoln and to which he had promised this letter to you i beg you will say to the president that this movement does not in the remotest way originate with me on the contrary when the committee called upon me i declined positively to enter into it or to consent to having my name mentioned to the president in connection with it the reasons which i gave to the committee were simply that i disapproved the project of raising and sending to the field colored troops in scattered and weak detachments that it would only result in disaster to the colored troops and would defeat effectually the expectations of the government to mass them in a solid force against the rebellion no short-reaching or partial plans can possibly succeed i told them 
that if i had been placed in the department which the president and secretary arranged for me when i was last in washington and in which i should have had a suitable field for this organization and white troops to protect it and ensure its success i could have undertaken it and have undoubtedly organized a formidable force imminently dangerous to the confederacy but these views were merely in answer to the committee and ended my relation to the subject i beg you to say to the president that i have no design to embarrass him with creating a department for me in my judgment this whole business is as dangerous and difficult as it is important it demands ability and great discretion and a fixed belief in the necessity of the work and should only be undertaken upon some plan which would embrace the whole subject and then be entrusted only to some officer of ability and judgment to whom the president would be willing to give the necessary powers he must have power and the president's confidence therefore i do not propose myself for this work but i make him the following suggestions it being understood i am thrown out of the question namely make a department of the country west of the mississippi louisiana excluded send them a suitable officer give him full command of the department and the white troops governor gamble himself included and let him draw the colored troops together from every quarter and organize and consolidate them he will have the whole line of the mississippi river for his operations and draw the colored men from the free north and the freedmen from the entire south in this way the west country and the mississippi river would be closed to the confederacy by an army of two hundred thousand men which at the proper time could take a deciding part in the war this is my view of the subject but is this time yet come will the president realize that if this summer's campaigns are not successful the confederacy is well nigh established i think not so if you think he will mix me up with the war plan makers of whose importunities he says he is tired please say nothing to him about it but pray don't let him think that i am moving in any direction or by any persons to get this command enclosed i return the president's letter which i have shown to no one i informed the committee that i had received it through yourself but could not communicate its purport without the authority of the president will you please make my thanks to the president for his friendly expressions in my favor and accept my very warm thanks to yourself i have just had a visit from your governor interesting and agreeable as his visits always are the various experiments suggestions and applications which have been related rendered it evident that the organization of the military strength of the black population of the country would not be fully accomplished by the mere sentiment of the black people or the enthusiastic and voluntary efforts of one or more popular leaders either white or black to supply the steady continuous official action necessary to broad success the government at length took up the work in its practical details early in april eighteen sixty three the secretary of war dispatched the adjutant general of the army general lorenzo thomas to the west to examine and report upon the feasibility of recruiting and using negro soldiers and his mission from the first was attended with success he telegraphed from memphis under date of april four eighteen sixty three i arrived here last night and explained this morning to general hurlbut the policy of the administration respecting the contrabands he says his corps will give it their support especially those regiments which have been in battle he desires six hundred as artillerists to man the heavy guns in position which he says can readily be raised from the contrabands within his lines i have authorized him to raise six companies and select the officers from memphis he went to lake providence louisiana where he addressed the divisions commanded by generals MacArthur and logan on april eight i announced to the former division in the morning four thousand being present the policy of the government respecting the black race and in the afternoon to general logan's division some seven thousand the troops received it with great enthusiasm and many speeches were made by officers of different rank fully endorsing the policy 
i asked from each of these divisions officers to raise two negro regiments but the difficulty will be to restrict them to that number for at least ten regiments can be obtained my first arrangements are for ten regiments and after these shall have been raised further arrangements will be made for others from the headquarters of general grant at milliken's bend he telegraphed on april sixteenth the policy respecting the negroes having been adopted commanding officers are perfectly willing and ready to afford every aid in carrying it out to a successful issue i shall find no difficulty in organizing negro troops to the extent of twenty thousand if necessary the prejudice in this army respecting arming the negroes is fast dying out about this date however general grant began his famous vicksburg campaign and the movement of the whole army unavoidably interrupted the recruiting operations of general thomas nevertheless he again reported from memphis under date of may eighteen returned from corinth after addressing the troops at twelve different places the policy with regard to the blacks enthusiastically received have authorized the following regiments two at helena one full the other will be completed by the end of the month five in louisiana organizing from lake providence to young's point two in mississippi but for the movement of grant these regiments would have been filled five thousand will be raised in these regions in two weeks my aim has been to raise twenty thousand and i see nothing to prevent it these reports made by the adjutant general were of such importance and such promise that the secretary of war on the twenty second of may eighteen sixty three by general orders established in the adjutant general's office of the war department a special bureau for the organization of colored troops its function was after providing for keeping proper records and regulating their enlistment and inspection to provide for furnishing them with competent white officers no person to be allowed to recruit colored troops except specially authorized by the war department and only those applicants for this service were to be commissioned whom a board of examination had passed with a designation of the proper grade for which each candidate was fit non-commissioned officers were to be selected from the best men among the recruits in the usual mode but it was impossible to put these wholesome restrictions immediately into practice and for a considerable time general thomas in the name of the secretary of war made such appointments in the regiments which he organized or in his absence provisional appointments were made by the department commanders subject to approval by the president and such scrutiny depending upon current personal reputation among armies in the practical trial of actual campaign was probably as likely to obtain good material as if made by boards of examination upon theoretical acquirements the raising of negro soldiers in the free states under state authority became successful only in massachusetts governor sprague of rhode island asked for permission to raise a regiment as early as september nine eighteen sixty two this however was before the government adopted the policy besides the opinion of governor andrew of massachusetts was it will be essential to the recruitment of the colored regiment commenced by governor sprague that the colored population of other states shall contribute towards it the number of persons of african descent in the state of rhode island alone being insufficient for the purpose on january twenty eighteen sixty three the latter obtained authority from the secretary of war for this object and issued his own order of recruitment on february seven governor andrew's anti-slavery zeal prompted him to make this example as conspicuous and successful as possible by every care and attention which his own authority could supply he selected the officers for the fifty fourth massachusetts volunteers writes his adjutant-general for men of acknowledged military ability and experience of the highest social position if possible in the state and men who believed in the capacity of colored men to make good soldiers frederick douglas the colored orator personally assisted in recruiting this regiment and two of his sons marched in its ranks completed organized and equipped the regiment after receiving an ovation in boston embarked on the twenty eighth day of may for south carolina another regiment the fifty fifth massachusetts colored was also organized immediately afterwards and sailed from boston on the twenty first of june for north carolina 
these two were the only colored regiments organized under state authority but efforts were set on foot in other states to recruit negroes under united states authority wherever this class of population seemed sufficient to furnish recruits the most promising field of course was in the border slave states but here local prejudice still threw obstacles in the way of this policy governor bramlett of kentucky in his inaugural address september one eighteen sixty three strongly objected to arming negroes governor bradford of maryland in a letter to the president while disclaiming any desire to arrest or impede any action of the government calculated to contribute to its safety or to crush the power of those who are assailing it complained that the slaves of maryland planters were secretly enlisted and carried away and he strongly protested against such methods governor gamble and the conservatives of missouri were to say the least thwarting rather than aiding such enlistments the governor indeed gave his consent but on condition that the laws of missouri should not be violated a condition almost impossible to observe even andrew johnson military governor of tennessee deprecated the sending of recruiting officers to tennessee saying that more laborers were needed than could be obtained to erect fortifications and that all the negroes will quit work when they can go into camp and do nothing it is exceedingly important for this question to be handled in such way as will do the least injury in forming a correct public judgment at this time we hope therefore that the organization of negro regiments in tennessee will be left to the general commanding this department and the military governor amidst the exciting events which attended lee's invasion of pennsylvania in june eighteen sixty three the work of organizing the black regiments like many other important matters was temporarily delayed but the happy issue of the battle of gettysburg and the simultaneous capture of vicksburg left the government free once more to push it with energy upon the twenty first of july president lincoln wrote to the secretary of war i desire that a renewed and vigorous effort be made to raise colored forces along the shores of the mississippi please consult the general-in-chief and if it is perceived that any acceleration of the matter can be effected let it be done i think the evidence is nearly conclusive that general thomas is one of the best if not the very best instruments for this service it is interesting to recall at this point how accurate had been the president's thoughts and investigations upon this whole question since in its original discussion before the cabinet of the previous year he had indicated the shores of the mississippi as the region where a negro military force might be most easily and speedily organized and most usefully employed the mission of general thomas had vindicated his sagacity shortly after his direction to the secretary of war the president also wrote to general grant a word upon another subject general thomas is gone again to the mississippi valley with a view of raising colored troops i have no reason to doubt that you are doing what you reasonably can upon the same subject i believe it is a resource which if vigorously applied now will soon close the contest it works doubly weakening the enemy and strengthening us we were not fully ripe for it until the river was opened now i think at least one hundred thousand can and ought to be rapidly organized along its shores relieving all white troops to serve elsewhere mr dana understands you as believing that the emancipation proclamation has helped some in your military operations i am very glad if this is so to this suggestion grant made a full and hearty response in the affirmative i have given the subject of arming the negro my hearty support this with the emancipation of the negroes is the heaviest blow yet given the confederacy the south rave a great deal about it and profess to be very angry but they were united in their action before and with the negro under subjection could spare their entire white population for the field now they complain that nothing can be got out of their negroes there has been great difficulty in getting able-bodied negroes to fill up the colored regiments in consequence of the rebel cavalry running off all that class to georgia and texas this is especially the case for a distance of fifteen or twenty miles on each side of the river i am now however sending two expeditions into louisiana one from natchez to harrisonburg and one from goodrich's landing to monroe that i expect will bring back a large number 
i have ordered recruiting officers to accompany these expeditions i am also moving a brigade of cavalry from tennessee to vicksburg which will enable me to move troops to a greater distance into the interior and will facilitate materially the recruiting service general thomas is now with me and you may rely on it i will give him all the aid in my power i would do this whether the arming the negro seemed to me a wise policy or not because it is an order that i am bound to obey and do not feel that in my position i have a right to question any policy of the government in this particular instance there is no objection however to my expressing an honest conviction that is by arming the negro we have added a powerful ally they will make good soldiers and taking them from the enemy weakens him in the same proportion they strengthen us i am therefore most decidedly in favor of pushing this policy to the enlistment of a force sufficient to hold all the south falling into our hands and to aid in capturing more it is needless to follow in further detail the systematic recruitment and organization of colored soldiers which went on from this time forward whatever misgivings or prejudices may have existed among the loyal people of the north or among conservative officers in the field faded out before the stern necessity of replenishing the armies which were not only being constantly wasted by disease and battle but whose aggressive campaigning strength was as continually being diminished by the very victories they gained involving an increase of local garrisons from the midsummer of eighteen sixty three little more was heard of opposition to colored troops except in the border states and from the more ultra-democratic politicians in the free states the policy had forced its own acceptance if not as a voluntary conviction at least as an unavoidable necessity and there was scarcely a district in the north in which the arms-bearing population was not entirely willing to receive colored soldiers from a single recruit to a regiment either in filling its complement of volunteers or in reducing its quota under the draft the new system of raising armies by conscription to which the government was obliged to resort during the year eighteen sixty three furnished to popular apprehension the most convincing and final argument in favor of the new policy of arming the blacks a law of congress approved february twenty fourth eighteen sixty four amendatory of the enrollment act provided that all able-bodied male colored persons between the ages of twenty and forty-five years resident in the united states should be enrolled and form part of the national forces with further provision that loyal masters of drafted slaves should receive bounty and compensation and that the slaves should become free if a single argument were needed to point out president lincoln's great practical wisdom in the management of this difficult question that argument is found in the mere summing up of its tangible military results at the beginning of december eighteen sixty three less than a year after the president first proclaimed the policy he was able to announce in his annual message that about fifty thousand late slaves were then actually bearing arms in the ranks of the union forces a report made by the secretary of war on april two eighteen sixty four shows that the number of negro troops then mustered into the service of the united states as soldiers had increased to seventy one thousand nine hundred and seventy six and we learn further from the report of the provost marshal general that at the close of the war there were in the service of the united states of colored troops one hundred and twenty regiments of infantry twelve regiments of heavy artillery ten companies of light artillery and seven regiments of cavalry making a grand aggregate of one hundred and twenty three thousand one hundred and fifty six men this was the largest number in service at any one time but it does not represent all of them the entire number commissioned and enlisted in this branch of the service during the war or more properly speaking during the last two years of the war was one hundred and eighty six thousand seventeen men this magnificent exhibit is a testimony to mr lincoln's statesmanship which can hardly be overvalued if he had adopted the policy when it was first urged upon him by impulsive enthusiasts it would have brought his administration to political wreck as was clearly indicated by the serious election reverses of eighteen sixty two 
but restraining the impatience and the bad judgment of his advisers and using that policy at the opportune moment he not only made it a powerful lever to effect emancipation but a military overweight aiding effectually to crush the remaining rebel armies and bring the rebellion as a whole to a speedy and sudden collapse one point of doubt about employing negroes as soldiers was happily removed almost imperceptibly by the actual experiment it had been a serious question with many thoughtful men whether the negro would fight it was apprehended that his comparatively recent transition from barbarism to civilization and the inherited habits of subjection and dependence imposed upon him by two centuries of enslavement had left his manhood so dwarfed and deadened as to render him incapable of the steady and sustained physical and moral courage needful to armies in modern warfare practical trial in skirmish and battle however proved the gallantry and reliability of the black soldier in the severest trials of devotion and heroism within half a year after lincoln's order of enlistment the black regiments had furnished such examples of bravery on many fields that commanders gave them unstinted praise and white officers and soldiers heartily accepted them as worthy and trusted companions in arms End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of abraham lincoln a history volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume six by john hay and john george nicolay chapter twenty one retaliation the rebel authorities watched the experiment of arming the blacks with the keenest apprehension and hostility in mr lincoln's order of july twenty two and eighteen sixty two directing military commanders to seize and use property real or personal for military purposes and to employ persons of african descent as laborers jefferson davis professed already to discover a wicked violation of the laws of war apparently forgetting that his own generals were everywhere using such persons in military labor when it was learned that hunter and phelps were endeavoring to organize negro regiments the language employed to express southern affectation of surprise and protest bordered on the ludicrous the best authenticated newspapers received from the united states writes general lee announce as a fact that major general hunter has armed slaves for the murder of their masters and has thus done all in his power to inaugurate a servile war which is worse than that of the savage inasmuch as it superadds other horrors to the indiscriminate slaughter of ages sexes and conditions and phelps is charged with imitating the bad example general halleck very properly returned this and another letter as insulting to the government of the united states a little later the confederate war department issued a formal order that major general hunter and brigadier general phelps be no longer held and treated as public enemies of the confederate states but as outlaws and that in the event of the capture of either of them or that of any other commissioned officer employed in drilling organizing or instructing slaves with a view to their armed service in this war he shall not be regarded as a prisoner of war but held in close confinement for execution as a felon at such time and place as the president shall order mr davis seems to have cultivated a sort of literary pride in these formulas of invective for in his sensational proclamation about lawry against general butler and all commissioned officers in his command he repeats african slaves have not only been incited to insurrection by every license and encouragement but numbers of them have actually been armed for a servile war a war in its nature far exceeding the horrors and most merciless atrocities of savages in this it was ordered that all negro slaves captured in arms be at once delivered over to the executive authorities of the respective states to which they belong to be dealt with according to the laws of said states and that butler and his commissioned officers 
robbers and criminals deserving death be whenever captured reserved for execution president lincoln's two proclamations of emancipation excited similar threats about a week after the first was issued it was made a subject of discussion in the confederate senate at richmond and a confederate writer recorded in his diary the next day some of the gravest of our senators favor the raising of the black flag asking and giving no quarter hereafter when the final proclamation reached richmond jefferson davis was writing his annual message to the rebel congress and he ransacked his dictionary for terms to stigmatize it our own detestation of those who have attempted the most execrable measure recorded in the history of guilty man is tempered by profound contempt for the impotent rage which it discloses this new provocation also broadened his field of retaliation he now declared that he would deliver such criminals as may attempt its execution all commissioned officers of the united states captured in states embraced in the proclamation to the executives of such states to be punished for exciting servile insurrection the confederate congress while responding to the full degree of the proposed retaliation nevertheless preferred to keep the power of such punishment in the hands of the central military authorities apparently as promising a more certain and summary execution that body passed a joint resolution approved by davis may one eighteen sixty three which prescribed that white officers of negro union soldiers shall if captured be put to death or be otherwise punished at the discretion of the court the trial to take place before the military court attached to the army or corps making the capture or such other military court as the confederate president should designate the confederate cabinet seems to have been quite ready to execute this law of summary retaliation prescribed by the confederate congress in a letter of suggestions written by j a seddon the confederate secretary of war to general e kirby smith commanding the trans mississippi department under date of august twelfth eighteen sixty three he said it is very probable that the forces employed by the enemy in guarding the river will consist in large measure of negro troops i think i have already in previous communications intimated to you as my own judgment that a most marked distinction should be made in the treatment when taken of these negro troops and of the white men leading them the latter had better be dealt with red-handed on the field or immediately thereafter the former to be considered rather as deluded victims of the hypocrisy and malignity of the enemy should not be driven to desperation but received readily to mercy and encouraged to submit and return to their masters when the confederate threats regarding negro soldiers were first launched the experiment had not yet been formally authorized by the government and as there was no probability that any early capture of such persons would be made by the enemy no attention was paid to rebel orders and proclamations on the subject a year later however when negro regiments were springing into full organization simultaneously in many places the matter became one of grave import as a rule the black regiments were commanded by white officers often selected as was specially the case with the fifty fourth massachusetts from the very best material whose bravery in incurring this additional risk deserved the extra watchfulness and protection of the government the most elementary justice required that if it called the black man to do a soldier's duty it must cover him with a soldier's right and northern sentiment was prompt in urging the claim frederick douglass has related how he pressed the point upon mr lincoln and the president's reply as to the exchange and general treatment of colored soldiers when taken prisoners of war he should insist on their being entitled to all privileges of such prisoners mr lincoln admitted the justice of my demand for the promotion of colored soldiers for good conduct in the field but on the matter of retaliation he differed from me entirely i shall never forget the benignant expression of his face the tearful look of his eye and the quiver in his voice when he deprecated a resort to retaliatory measures once again said he i do not know where such a measure would stop he said he could not take men out and kill them in cold blood for what was done by others 
if he could get hold of the persons who were guilty of killing the colored prisoners in cold blood the case would be different but he could not kill the innocent for the guilty nevertheless in view of the great success which attended the enlistment of black recruits it became necessary for the government to adopt a settled policy on the question and on july thirty eighteen sixty three the president issued the following comprehensive order it is the duty of every government to give protection to its citizens of whatever class color or condition and especially to those who are duly organized as soldiers in the public service the law of nations and the usages and customs of war as carried on by civilized powers permit no distinction as to color in the treatment of prisoners of war as public enemies to sell or enslave any captured person on account of his color and for no offense against the laws of war is a relapse into barbarism and a crime against the civilization of the age the government of the united states will give the same protection to all its soldiers and if the enemy shall sell or enslave any one because of his color the offense shall be punished by retaliation upon the enemy's prisoners in our possession it is therefore ordered that for every soldier of the united states killed in violation of the laws of war a rebel soldier shall be executed and for every one enslaved by the enemy or sold into slavery a rebel soldier shall be placed at hard labor on the public works and continued at such labor until the other shall be released and receive the treatment due to a prisoner of war it is a gratification to record that the rebel government did not persist in the barbarous conduct it had officially announced and that sanguinary retaliation did not become necessary there were indeed some unimportant instances of imprisonment of captured blacks as hostages for which a few rebel soldiers were ordered into confinement by general halleck but the cases were not pushed to extremity under executive sanction on either side much more serious excesses however occurred under the responsibility and conduct of individual officers it is probable that most of them went unrecorded in october eighteen sixty two when the guerrilla outrages in missouri were in one of their moments of fiercest activity a union citizen of palmyra was abducted and murdered under circumstances which clearly marked it as an instance of concerted and deliberate partisan revenge in retaliation for this colonel john mcneill the union officer in local command who was under orders to deal severely and summarily with this class of offenders having demanded the perpetrators which demand was not complied with ordered the execution of ten rebel guerrillas of the same neighborhood and carried out the order with military publicity and formality even admitting the strong provocation modern sentiment could scarcely justify a punishment tenfold as severe as that demanded by the mosaic law but general mcneill has lately printed a letter explaining the circumstances in which he says the ten guerrillas executed not one of whom but had committed murder under circumstances of atrocity were selected from twenty-two who had previously been formally tried by a united states military commission and sentenced to death so that their death was but hastened by the act of retaliation the remaining twelve of the twenty-two convicted being soon afterwards shot in pursuance of their sentence by the officers in command at macon city and mexico missouri less than a month later there was brief mention in a letter of the rebel major-general holmes to the confederate war department of an analogous occurrence in northern texas a secret organization he wrote to resist the confederate conscript act in northern texas has resulted in the citizens organizing a jury of investigation and i am informed they have tried and executed forty of those convicted and thus this summary procedure has probably crushed the incipient rebellion even without the details the incident is a convincing explanation of the seeming unanimity for rebellion in that region the most shocking occurrence of this character however followed the employment of negro soldiers we cannot adequately picture the vindictive rage of many rebel masters at seeing recent slaves uniformed and armed in defence of a government which had set them free under the barbarous institution to perpetuate which they committed treason and were ready to die 
they had punished their human chattels with the unchecked lash sold them on the auction block hunted them with bloodhounds and it is hardly to be wondered at that amid the license of war individuals among them now and then thought to restore their domination by the aid of military slaughter as an evidence that such thoughts existed here and there we need only cite the language of major-general john c breckinridge late vice-president of the united states writing under date of august fourteenth eighteen sixty two to the union commander at baton rouge he recites in a list of alleged outrages that information has reached these headquarters that negro slaves are being organized and armed to be employed against us and as i am authorized by major-general van dorn commanding this department to inform you that the above acts are regarded as in violation of the usage of civilized warfare and that in future upon any departure from these usages he will raise the black flag and neither give nor ask quarter mere official bravado from however conspicuous a personage only deserves mention when as in this instance it illustrates a type of feeling which in one case at least manifested itself in an incident of shocking barbarity in the spring of the year eighteen sixty four president lincoln went to baltimore to attend the opening of a large fair for the benefit of the sanitary commission in concluding the address which he was called upon to make on that occasion he said a painful rumor true i fear has reached us of the massacre by the rebel forces at fort pillow in the west end of tennessee on the mississippi river of some three hundred colored soldiers and white officers who had just been overpowered by their assailants there seems to be some anxiety in the public mind whether the government is doing its duty to the colored soldier and to the service at this point at the beginning of the war and for some time the use of colored troops was not contemplated and how the change of purpose was wrought i will not now take time to explain upon a clear conviction of duty i resolved to turn that element of strength to account and i am responsible for it to the american people to the christian world to history and on my final account to god having determined to use the negro as a soldier there is no way but to give him all the protection given to any other soldier the difficulty is not in stating the principle but in practically applying it it is a mistake to suppose the government is indifferent to this matter or is not doing the best it can in regard to it we do not to-day know that a colored soldier or white officer commanding colored soldiers has been massacred by the rebels when made a prisoner we fear it believe it i may say but we do not know it to take the life of one of their prisoners on the assumption that they murder ours when it is short of certainty that they do murder ours might be too serious too cruel a mistake we are having the fort pillow affair thoroughly investigated and such investigation will probably show conclusively how the truth is if after all that has been said it shall turn out that there has been no massacre at fort pillow it will be almost safe to say there has been none and will be none elsewhere if there has been the massacre of three hundred there or even the tenth part of three hundred it will be conclusively proven and being so proven the retribution shall as surely come it will be matter of grave consideration in what exact course to apply the retribution but in the supposed case it must come the investigation referred to by the president was made by the committee on the conduct of the war and included the sworn testimony of about eighty witnesses most of them actual participants in the occurrence the committee found that fort pillow tennessee situated on the mississippi river and garrisoned by about five hundred and fifty seven union troops of whom two hundred and sixty two were colored was captured by assault by an overwhelming force of confederates under general forrest on april twelfth eighteen sixty four and that of the men from three hundred to four hundred are known to have been killed at fort pillow of whom at least three hundred were murdered in cold blood after the post was in possession of the rebels and our men had thrown down their arms and ceased to offer resistance 
it further appears that this inhumanity was directed principally against the colored soldiers the rebel general and his subordinates stoutly denied the accusation of vindictiveness but their explanations and later evidence failed to shake the general substance of the committee's allegation and proof indeed it would be difficult to refute the conclusiveness of the first report of general forrest himself on the third day after his exploit he telegraphed to general polk i attacked fort pillow on the morning of the twelfth instant with a part of bell's and mcculloch's brigades numbering blank under brigadier general j r chalmers after a short fight we drove the enemy seven hundred strong into the fort under cover of their gunboats and demanded a surrender which was declined by major l w booth commanding united states forces i stormed the fort and after a contest of thirty minutes captured the entire garrison killing five hundred and taking one hundred prisoners and a large amount of quartermaster stores the officers in the fort were killed including major booth i sustained a loss of twenty killed and sixty wounded the confederate flag now floats over the fort this astonishing result is further explained by the contemporaneous threats made officially by these confederate officers on the twenty fifth of march preceding in demanding the surrender of paducah kentucky general forrest wrote if you surrender you shall be treated as prisoners of war but if i have to storm your works you may expect no quarter and on the day following the fort pillow massacre general a buford one of forrest's brigadiers said in his demand for the surrender of columbus kentucky should you surrender the negroes now in arms will be returned to their masters should i however be compelled to take the place no quarter will be shown to the negro troops whatever the white troops will be treated as prisoners of war and in a subsequent correspondence forrest wrote under date of june twenty to the union general c c washburn i regard captured negroes as i do other captured property and not as captured soldiers the language of these officers at paducah and columbus is a sufficient commentary on their achievement at fort pillow the excuse of hot blood and sudden passion can hardly be urged in extenuation for nearly a full year the subject had been under official scrutiny and debate their secretary of war had long since officially suggested red-handed dealings on the field or immediately thereafter for white officers of colored regiments with mercy for negro soldiers that the latter might not be driven to desperation whether forrest and others read a hidden meaning between the lines of the confederate secretary's letter or whether they chose to defy the spirit it breathed their acts have the appearance of a deliberate policy and intention president lincoln formally took up the consideration of the subject on the third of may by writing to the several members of his cabinet it is now quite certain that a large number of our colored soldiers with their white officers were by the rebel force massacred after they had surrendered at the recent capture of fort pillow so much is known though the evidence is not yet quite ready to be laid before me meanwhile i will thank you to prepare and give me in writing your opinion as to what course the government should take in the case the answers of his advisers differed widely mr seward affirmed the duty of the government to vindicate the right of all its soldiers to be regarded and treated as prisoners of war nevertheless he urged great caution in any proceeding looking to retaliation and advised for the present only the setting apart and rigorous confinement of an equal number of confederate prisoners as hostages until the rebel government could be called upon to explain or disavow the cruelties and give pledges that they should not be repeated mr chase held the same view except that he advised that the hostages should be selected from rebel prisoners of highest rank in number equivalent according to the rules of exchange to the officers and men murdered at fort pillow mr stanton also advised that the hostages be selected from rebel officers that forrest chalmers and all officers and men concerned in the fort pillow massacre be excluded from the benefit of the president's proclamation of amnesty and from the privilege of exchange and their delivery for punishment be demanded from the richmond authorities in default of which delivery the president should take such measures against the hostages as the state of things then existing might make necessary the advice of mr wells was essentially the same as that of mr stanton 
mr blair on the contrary took different ground there are two reasons he wrote which would prevent me from ordering the execution of prisoners man for man in retaliation for the massacre at fort pillow first that i do not think the measure would be justified by the rules of civilized warfare even in a contest between alien enemies second because even if allowable in such a contest it would not be just in itself or expedient in the present contest and the inclination of my mind is to pursue the actual offenders alone in such cases as the present to order the most energetic measures for their capture and the most summary punishment when captured a proclamation or order that the guilty individuals are to be hunted down will have far greater terrors and be far more effectual to prevent the repetition of the crime than the punishment of parties not concerned in that crime mr bates agreed in opinion with mr blair he would demand of the enemy a disavowal or an avowal of the act if he disavow it then demand the surrender of the generals guilty of the fort pillow massacre to be dealt with at your discretion if he avow and justify the act then instruct your commanders to cause instant execution upon any and all participants in the massacre whether officers or privates who should fall into their power he added i would have no compact with the enemy for mutual slaughter no cartel of blood and murder no stipulation to the effect that if you murder one of my men i will murder one of yours retaliation is not mere justice it is avowedly revenge and is wholly unjustifiable in law and conscience unless adopted for the sole purposes of punishing past crime and of giving a salutary and blood-saving warning against its repetition mr usher also joined in the opinion that punishment should not be visited upon innocent persons but he urged that the government should set apart for execution an equal number of prisoners who since the massacre have been or may hereafter from time to time be captured from forrest's command he also urged another reason we are upon the eve of an impending battle until the result shall have been known it seems to me to be inexpedient to take any extreme action in the premises if favourable to our arms we may retaliate as far as the laws of war and humanity will permit if disastrous and extreme measures should have been adopted we may be placed in a position of great embarrassment and forced to forego our threatened purpose in order to avoid a worse calamity it is probable that this view took a deep hold upon the cabinet grant was about entering upon his wilderness campaign and its rapid succession of bloody conflicts crowded out of view and consideration a topic so difficult and so hazardous as wholesale retaliation for the fort pillow barbarity which on one hand strict justice demanded and which on the other enlightened humanity forbade in these opposing duties there could be little doubt toward which the kind heart of the president would incline he had long since laid down for himself a rule of conduct applicable to this class of cases in his annual message of december three eighteen sixty one he had declared in considering the policy to be adopted for suppressing the insurrection i have been anxious and careful that the inevitable conflict for this purpose shall not degenerate into a violent and remorseless revolutionary struggle it does not appear that the fort pillow question was ever seriously renewed in the cabinet or definitely concluded by the president the proceedings relating to retaliation which we have thus far sketched bring us back to another and by no means the least interesting phase of the general subject of negro soldiers we may here anticipate the course of events so far as to say that in the autumn and winter of eighteen sixty four the cause of the south was already lost and the collapse of the confederate government plainly foreshadowed to all except the leaders whose infatuation and wounded vanity made them unwilling to acknowledge and accept defeat yet this effort to avoid confession of error in one direction compelled them to admit it in another they had seceded for slavery had made it the cornerstone of their government had anathematized president lincoln for his decrees of emancipation had pronounced the ban of outlawry and had prescribed the sentence of death against every white officer who might dare to command negro troops but now in their extremity some of them proposed to throw consistency to the winds and themselves commit the acts upon which they had invoked the reprobation of mankind and for which they had ordained extreme punishment 
it would be difficult to estimate the benefit they had derived from the direct military labor of the slave especially in building fortifications they now proposed not only to put arms in his hands and make him a soldier to fight in the ranks but also as a final step to emancipate him for the service even the flexible political conscience of jefferson davis however winced a little at the bold abandonment of principle which this policy involved and in his message of november seventh eighteen sixty four to the confederate congress he argued the question with the reluctance of a man preparing to walk over live coals we have not space to abridge his hair-splitting arguments to justify the south in what they had so vociferously denounced when done by the north the sum of his recommendation is that the twenty thousand slaves then employed in various labors in the confederate army should be increased to forty thousand be drilled in encamping marching and parking trains and employed as a pioneer and engineer laborer he says i must dissent from those who advise a general levy and arming of the slaves for the duty of soldiers until our white population shall prove insufficient for the armies we require and can afford to keep in the field to employ as a soldier the negro who has merely been trained to labor and as a laborer the white man accustomed from his youth to the use of firearms would scarcely be deemed wise or advantageous by any and this is the question now before us but should the alternative ever be presented of subjugation or of the employment of the slave as a soldier there seems no reason to doubt what should then be our decision while he dwells on the improbable contingency of our need of resorting to this element of resistance he nevertheless points out that the confederate government might buy the slave from his master and engage to liberate him as a reward for a faithful military service mr davis's hesitating and tentative recommendation was seed sown on barren ground if the dose was unpalatable to him it appears to have been yet more bitter to the members of the confederate congress who doubtless felt as has been pithily expressed by a confederate writer that it was an admission of the inherent injustice of slavery that if the negro was fit to be a soldier he was not fit to be a slave that the proposition cut under the traditions and theories of three generations in the south and that by a few strokes of the pen the confederate government had subscribed to the main tenet of the abolition party in the north and all its consequences standing exposed and stultified before the world as the fall of the confederacy drew nigh the stress of disaster compelled his acceptance of the distasteful alternative though even then he could not refrain from expressing the hope that the grim necessity would somehow be averted on the thirtieth of march eighteen sixty five he wrote to governor william smith of virginia i am happy to receive your assurance of success as well as your promise to seek legislation to secure unmistakably freedom to the slave who shall enter the army with a right to return to his old home when he shall have been honorably discharged from the military service i remain of the opinion that we should confine our first efforts to getting volunteers and would prefer that you would adopt such measures as would advance that mode of recruiting rather than that concerning which you make inquiry to wit by issuing a requisition for the slaves as authorized by the statutes of virginia they debated the unwelcome subject with qualms and grimaces through november december january and most of february on the eleventh of january and again on the eighteenth of february the proposal received a notable support in letters from general lee in which he declared the measure of employing negro soldiers not only expedient but necessary and recommended that the confederate president be empowered to call upon individuals or states for such as they are willing to contribute with the condition of emancipation to all enrolled even under this pressure however the rebel lawmakers could not wholly conquer their repugnance nearly six weeks more elapsed and the fall of richmond was already imminent when on the thirtieth of march eighteen sixty five the confederate congress passed an act upon the subject which provided that if under the previous sections of this act the president shall not be able to raise a sufficient number of troops to prosecute the war successfully and maintain the sovereignty of the states and the independence of the confederate states then he is hereby authorized to call on each state whenever he thinks it expedient for her quota of three hundred thousand troops in addition to those subject to military service under existing laws 
or so many thereof as the president may deem necessary for the purposes herein mentioned to be raised from such of the population irrespective of color in each state as the proper authorities thereof may determine the confederate writer pollard sums up the result as follows the law as finally enacted was merely to authorize the president to receive into the military service such able-bodied slaves as might be patriotically tendered by their masters to be employed in whatever capacity he might direct no change to be made in the relation of owners of slaves at least so far as it appeared in the bill the fruits of this emasculated measure were two companies of blacks organized from some negro vagabonds in richmond which were allowed to give balls at the libby prison and were exhibited in fine fresh uniforms on capitol square as decoys to obtain sable recruits but the mass of their colored brethren looked on the parade with unenvious eyes and little boys exhibited the early prejudices of race by pelting the fine uniforms with mud end of chapter twenty one end of abraham lincoln a history volume six by john hay and john george nicolay